Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Cybersecurity Amplified and Intensified, the number one cybersecurity podcast with your host, Eric Taylor, and myself, Shiva Maharaj. Today, we have Brian Weiss of iTech Solutions, the world's number one VAM. <laughs> and today, I want to kick it off with some asset management because we haven't done, we missed a week. Mr. Eric was uh, getting some classes done with SANS, which is always a fantastic thing because I get to learn some stuff through him as always. But Eric, how many times have you walked into an IR asking for an asset management list and they're like, what? and for those of you looking, I'm doing the shoulder shrug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so anytime we come in and we're like, hey, we got a potential point of compromisation, you know, we'll start asking, okay, so how many servers, how many VMs, how many, uh, whatever you have, right? Most of the time they don't know, like, okay, are any of these things virtual? Most of them don't know. Or they'll be like, oh yeah. And I'm like, all right, are you running parallels? Are you running uh, VMware? Or are you running Hyper-V? Um, uh, don't, don't know, don't know. And most of the time, even if they do know some of these things, their numbers are way off. All right. So we had a case a couple weeks ago where it was like, oh yeah, we have like 13 VMs and 96 workstations. All right, cool. Go to find out they had 103 servers and 423 workstations. And the CT, the, literally the CTO was like, oh, we have a bigger network than I thought. I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay. So what do you do when you get into that situation? We just have a conversation that simply says, you know, you have, we're going to, this thing is going to take longer to go through. You know, we, we weren't scoped to do this type of thing. Um, can we handle it? Absolutely. Right. But it's going to take longer to weed through and find the central point of compromisation. And from what there, it, where they, they do the lateral movement. What does it look like for you to establish an asset inventory? Because I, I would imagine that's part of your playbook or the beginning of your playbook. It is. So, you know, full disclosure, we are massive CrowdStrike fans here. And I will literally start deploying CrowdStrike and start finding out what is on the network. So everything gets a CrowdStrike agent because I'm able to do IR that way by running scripts in the background to actually pull the inventory in for analysis. And with the service levels that we have in CrowdStrike, I'm able to see network telepathy. I'm able to see, you know, you know, the HP printers and things of that nature. I mean, we can't log into them naturally with CrowdStrike, but we can start at least getting an asset inventory of what's there and what's not there. And, you know, have we, do we have agents on these particular devices and go from there? Are you also deploying an RMM agent? <laughs> we were, we were, uh, with the whole recent issues last year with RMM and the insurance companies, especially, um, that one, I forget, uh, Allstate, nationwide. I think it was. Oh yeah. I'll say That's right. They. A lot of insurance companies that are running the IR do not want an RMM, which, okay, I get it. Uh, a lot of RMMs have a way to do screen sharing, things of that nature. And we're just there for data analytics. We're there to pull data. We're there to view logs. We're there that, and most of the time I can do it without needing a data or a connectwise agent or whatever. So, you know, we got screen, uh, not screen connect, but we have, a uh, a splash top that we use and sometimes her team we have a corporate team viewer account now so depending on what their current infrastructure is some will jump in and you know set up gpos and start deploying the cross track agent some you know most of the time these networks are freaking completely hosed so we have to do some manual stuff you know so we always we're always going to need some sort of screen sharing application to go on but to actually have an actual rmm speaking hmm. of uh using an rmm yeah. This is a little conversation I had with uh, Taz Wake, and I really apologize if I butchered your name. Please let me know. I am sure there are thousands of people that will in the meantime. You know, he was joking about having an MSP get some data to him just on a USB. Mm -hmm. And I made the joke, you know, MSP is not equal IR capable. And he came back with, hey, I dropped the IR, as you can see here. Brian, you're an MSP. I'm an MSP, or we own MSPs. What are you doing for asset management? And are you a, do you think you're able to help 
someone doing IR or do you just clear out and let them do their thing? If it was for one of our existing clients, we would definitely be involved. Um, we have to use multiple tools to identify our assets right now, unfortunately. Um, so we have a combination of Intune, which is, you know, Windows, Mac devices, mainly mobile devices is what we're, what that's capturing for us that our RMM doesn't have. And then in our RMM, we're handling anything it supports like network devices. Um, the tricky part are, is, you know, locking down networks so that you don't have rogue network devices showing up. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and cause you could do your identification and be like, all right, here's everything I see. I've got an agent, I've got things being monitored, but what happens when additional devices show up and how is that handled? Do you have them properly VLAN or, you know, and that's feels like it's an ongoing battle with our clients, especially as they add IOT devices. Um, so, right, are you not doing any sort of MAC address whitelisting on your switches and, you know, tagging the switches for certain VLAN so that way when they have to, you know, connect any device, they have to reach out and say, hey, this is what we're doing. I know that layer adds a layer of complexity because most of these folks don't know how to find a MAC address on a device, an IoT or anything like that, like that. but are you starting to look into that or have you implemented yeah. that at all? Yeah, that, that's an area that we're looking to improve with our clients, essentially network access control. Oh. Um, so, you know, more importantly, even on the Wi-Fi, we want to get to a point where we're doing directory authentication just to access Wi-Fi. Um, so, you know, as, as we get our clients up, updated with more cloud managed equipment, you know, we're, we're looking at getting into Meraki. I have a question um, for you there. With using the authentication to get onto the wireless network, are you still doing segmentation? And the reason I yes. ask this is because for my clients, there are three, maybe four wireless networks. There is the core network that company assets can get onto. There is a employee wireless SID where they can listen to their Spotify, do whatever they want because they can't do that on a on the corporate LAN or the corporate WAN or wireless network. And then you have your typical guest network for those who want that or not. Mm -hmm. So are you just allowing the employees to authenticate to come on to the network or are you really segmenting and saying, Hey, if this is a personal device, it's not coming on. It, it's we're doing as much as we can with the controls we have in place right now, but you know, an employee knows the private SSID and password and they're lazy. Why, Why do they know it? They got into it somehow. that shit, man. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, there, there's plenty of ways around it. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying there's not a solution. I'm just saying it's an area that we're still behind with. I feel like we're, we're, we're past the average MSP, you know, as far as identification and, and network access control, but just the, the nature of our, of our, some of our clients, you know, they're, they're even behind the times with security still we're trying to, you know, we've got other bigger fires we're trying to put out with some of these clients. Well, I, I, if, I mean, we can go into detail as much as you'd like here, but I know you were using a vendor and you came to the realization that they were probably not as secure as they needed to be. And I give you credit to the point where you pulled up stakes and was like, peace out, dude, this is not for me anymore. And you know, we can go into it. You don't have to name them, but uh, I'd leave that up to you. Yeah, it's kind of a struggle that, um, that I realized, you know, I, I'm starting to have more of where I, I, I just can't trust, uh, you know, a, a security product born in the MSP space, like, like I thought I could in the sense that, you know, you have to wonder what are they putting first, you know? Do you know anyone who's ever told you that not to trust MSP specific software? I'm just curious. There, there's a couple guys I know that I do podcasts with every now and then that <laughs> have kind of made me realize that, but you know, really what it comes down to is, is the channel they're serving, right? I mean, you've got MSPs, SMBs who aren't up on security, who maybe don't under they, they don't think security first, just cause that's not a space they came from. 
And they're the ones that are buying these products. So when you think about an industry who's voting with dollars and the people spending the dollars aren't caring about needing certain enterprise security features, that they're just not going to come out of the, out of the box with, with those features. Why, why invest in that if your customer base isn't asking for it, right? I think one of the biggest issues at hand in the managed services vertical is that people think by being a managed services provider, you are automatically a security practitioner. And I think that is so far from the truth. And maybe MSPs need to stay in that lane of, hey, we will help keep your network running and going. And maybe we need to outsource to an MSSP who's an actual MSSP, not someone who bought some bolt-on products and want to say they are. Like, go to an Eric over at BarricadeCyber.com, shameless plug here. But God forbid I need IR. First person I'm going to call is Eric. And if he, if he can slot me in, great. If not, I'm like, dude, who do you recommend? But I have an engagement with Eric for IR for my all of my customers because I don't want to get to the point of an incident and not have an agreement in place. So I recommend Eric selfishly, but whatever. I, I think a lot of MSPs need to get to that point where they have an active engagement. Brian, you often talk about an incident you went through because you had a uh, vendor who had a piece of shit product and still does. No, I'm not talking about Kaseya. Maybe I am, but whatever. So you, and I'm not going to name names here again, because uh, this is not, this episode is not about shaming people. I think this is about edu this, uh, this one episode is about educating people. Mm -hmm. Maybe. You had an engagement with a IR firm or IR person or whatever you want to call it. And they pretty much ghosted you and tried to offload you to another company they had ownership in or something like that. How long did it take you to settle not settled. How long did it take you to find a company to handle your IR for you? Well, <clears throat> that was kind of a twofold um, process I went through. Um, they they brought the, the I had the insurance company initially bring in an IR team because I said, hey, if you want to be guaranteed this is cleaned up, I want you to own the IR team that's coming in and, and taking care of this, um, so that they can't point the finger back to me. But but after the cleanup, I wanted to engage in a, another IR team to basically do a risk assessment, essentially, with us and figure out, like, where are our gaps that we're not even thinking about yet? And, and because we were pretty much out in the cloud, a lot of it had to do with, hey, I want you to look into our cloud vendors and identify concerns with them. And what's interesting is back then, uh, when I think about the things they were going to look into and, and ask about, it didn't really go into, Hey, let me, let me red team that tool for you. Let me find out if, you know, if this thing's secure or if it's got any holes in it. Right. And, and so even back then it was more like, Hey, is the vendor SOC 2 compliant? Is their database encrypted? Right? Like what type of, who's got access to what, you know, it was kind of that high level without really talking about, you know, hey, let's find out if there's vulnerabilities in the software, you know, let alone is the vendor doing their due diligence. It's okay. All so, MSP softwares are 1000% secure. There's not a goddamn thing wrong with any of them. And Eric has never found any. Of them. <laughs> That's what I was getting ready to talk about just a little bit. The, the fact, so we're getting more and more MSPs coming to me and saying, hey, we want to do an assessment, just like what you're saying, Brad. We want to see where our vulnerabilities are. We want to see where the gaps are and things of that nature. And I have to express to them, like, look, you know, you're using X, Y, or Z product. They are cloud hosted. I cannot legally pen test that company because they don't have a VDP program. And some of the tools that I, I do, or the, some of the tools that I use will cause a DDoS on a lot of smaller infrastructures you know there's msps that are doing this and it it causes a problem you know and these are major rmm platforms that are doing this right? and there's other vendors that were doing this against this brought down complete freaking systems before that 
I'm like, I'm just own nesting your network guy. I'm just doing some fuzzing and sorry it happened. Didn't mean to, but you know, we got to be really careful. So it really comes back to, you know, if you're using a synchro or you're using a Kase or you're using, you know, ConnectWise or whatever the case is, and you're using it as a cloud application, do you really trust your vendor? You know, we've talked about this numerous times on this program. When you're assessing your vendors, are you having those security talks with them? Hey, do you have a VDP program? You know, are you disclosing it? What does that look like? So when you engage somebody like us, you know, or, you know, Black Hills or Kroll or, you know, Coveware or whatever, you know, you could be able to say, hey, look, we have vendor X, Y, and Z. When you're evaluating us, we know that that's a problem and, you know, or no, it's not going to be a problem. They do have a VDP program. If you find something, you know, then this is the, the chain of command that you got to go. And that's the other side of things like those pro those companies that have VDP programs. That's one thing that I've been struggling with a lot. Cause we've had a couple of MSPs that use, I would just say a very large platform. And they have many, many products inside of their suite and when we find something, it, who am I responsible to disclose to? I mean, I'll tell you my answer in a second, but you know, because they have a VDP program, do I withhold my findings to the customer? Let the pro the program, the RMM or whatever the program is, do I let them know, give them ample time to hurry up and do some sort of mitigation before disclosing it to the customer? These are things that be considered, you know, and when you're looking at doing these type of things, you need to understand your threats landscape. You need to understand what all these things are doing and know how to disclose certain things and fix certain things. I want to bring this back to asset management. I mean, we all, there's been a vendor in the MSP space recently. They had an issue with a part of their system. I'm not going to call it out because I think it would make it too obvious as to who they are. But clearly they failed at their asset inventory. Yeah. And what would happen if those systems were exploited because of that failure? And another thing I want to go back to, Brian, is you know, you you mentioned the SOC 2 report for one of your vendors. You wanted to get a clean bill of health. I think one of the things that people don't realize is a SOC 2 audit is about that business's and its operations, not necessarily how they interact with you or how their product interacts with you as their customer, much less when you go further down the line for your customers. So I think there needs to be a little more transparency with the vendors or from the vendors showing us what processes and procedures are in place. And one thing I really wish we could get to is having a zero knowledge architecture with all of our vendors where they don't know what we're putting in there. But the data that we put in, the data that our clients put in, it's being monetized so much. I don't think mm -hmm. we're ever going to get there. It's just, it's not, I don't think it's a possibility. I mean, I think it really depends on the business structure, right? Is, is the business giving you a cheap rate of whatever product so that that way they can data mine your information and sell it off for advertising dollars. Well, I think they're always going to do that off the bat unless they are not allowed to, right? And the only systems that you may not have that happen to you is if you are going for some type of FedRAM product where they're not supposed to know what's in there. Mm -hmm. And if you can get onto their FedRAM platform, then yeah, you have a good shot at this. But it's not always 100%, I would say. What are your thoughts, Brian? Well, if you look at how Microsoft's doing it, they're, they're like physically separating, you know, their, their GCC high, right? So you can't even get on it unless you're a qualified organization. So that would be another question too. Like if someone is FedRAMP certified, are you sharing servers with people that, that don't even need FedRAMP that are in the commercial space, right? Well, why can't everyone have a service or services where the vendors don't need to know what's in there or can't find out what's in there. Yeah. But I'm thinking even, you know, lateral attacks. Okay. Vendor can't see anything from either of these, you know, two companies that are on the same server. I think they could. 
I think I think even in GCC high, Microsoft has a certain degree of visibility. Yeah. I think the GCC um, standard for 365 is more so designed for the client and Microsoft being the vendor relationship. But it's to me, it's just more controlled access. I mean, you were one of the first people to sell GCC for your distributor. What was that process like? Uh, nice and painful. I imagine. Why was it painful? Well, I mean, it, it was just slow. You know, it was having to verify that it, it was a city that we brought on, right? And it was having to verify they are who they are. It, it felt like you're getting a Bitcoin wallet. Right. So you're, you're telling me their, their fully qualified domain name was not registered somewhere as a city? Well, yeah, it, is, it was, but they, we still had to submit like a, a, you know, it was more, they were giving, uh, approval for me to be their CSP, okay. right? That, that was really what it came down to. But obviously with their, F, you know, their domain name, um, they are already seen as a, as a, uh, local government uh entity but but i guess you're right it was more when i think back to it it was more like hey are you sure that you're okay with this msp being your csp right and it was that registration all even even with the the the, the vendor pax 8 that was involved right it was like hey microsoft was wanting to know hey are you okay with itech and pax 8 being involved in this chain of custody, right? For your licensing, essentially. Mm -hmm. See, that's where I think GCC should never, ever go through a CSP, quite honestly. Yeah. I think it should be sold directly. You apply your partner number as a digital partner of record to get credits on it. Maybe some kind of spiff, but have and taking you and your company out of it, but now you have a company you have a distributor, you have a IT provider, you have infinitely more than three, but you have three different vectors of attack. Obviously there yeah. are going to be hundreds of vectors of attack, but compromise your company, compromise your distributor, compromise the end client. And this is why I think if we can get a handle on proper asset management and then we can start dealing with controlled access. How many times have either one of you walked into a new client or a prospect or what have you, no asset inventory and even less in terms of access management? I, I can probably tell you how many times I've actually walked into a business and they actually had it. One. Probably. Mm. It, it's just a big thing. I mean, the whole log j4 issue what's that, that? <laughs> what, what, what's that i don't know you know i don't want unify so I, I it didn't affect me ah uh, god that train <laughs> now do you think that that's more of a maturity problem or like a dollar problem not wanting to so spend what, money? what 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 are we talking about here just you know walking into the average business and and not seeing proper practices in place around security I personally think it's a education driven by a, I don't want to spend money for this nonsense thing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I would say as you get into the smaller businesses, it, it's definitely both, but ultimately comes down to not wanting to spend money. Even if you educate them. I disagree. Them. I have a, I've, my managed customers, they go from anything from five user up to a couple hundred. There's one that's infinitely larger, but that's a snowflake or a unicorn as we call it. And I joke around, my plumbing company client is probably more secure than most banks out there, most financial institutions, lawyers, accountants, because they understand the importance and they are spending more per user than some, a lot of accountants and law firms are spending. So, but, but that, that, wouldn't you say those were kind of unicorn in that size, you know, market? Yeah, because right? I have a lot of them and it's about, okay, let me pat myself on the back here. I was able to have, as you would say, an actionable conversation with 
with these business owners and explain what we do, how we do it, and why it would be important to them, right? And at the end of the day, they understood what I attempted to convey, and money was a secondary consideration. Because let's be honest here, security, best practice, process, and procedures are not cheap. They're not free. They cost money. Yeah, I, I guess the point I was making is, as we've been working with larger enterprise companies, the dollar is not necessarily the barrier that you might see more often with smaller companies. Mm -hmm. it, ten exactly. it tends to be more of a maturity thing, really down to the fact that the internal IT people they have don't are, are, are underqualified for, for, <laughs> for what they're doing, right? Low barrier to entry for IT? <sighs> no. So, so, so the company would spend the money if they knew, Hey, we should be spending this, but they're not getting the information well, they need pro from their internal IT to really, I want to qualify guide them, right here. Do you think these enterprise companies are okay with spending the money or it's their interpretation that if they spend the money with you, they're mitigating their risk and, and you're sharing that risk profile with them. Well, it's definitely a risk issue, right? No, no enterprise company, when they're looking at their budget, just willy nilly spends money on tech, unless it's going to add efficiencies or mitigate some I sort of know, risk. I know a lot of enterprises that use Webroot, and I know a lot of enterprises that use some of the channel specific socks. There's but, one channel specific sock that I like, and that's black. I think John and his team have done a fantastic job with it. You can attest to that more than I, because you've gone deeper with them. Yeah, I, I guess, but, but whose fault is that? Is that internal IT for thinking web roots okay to use and they're not pushing for something better, you know? I think the fault goes with management or people in charge of IT not understanding what risk truly is and hence they don't understand what the risk mitigation is. Mm -hmm. Web root AV, not just web root, but. AV is just a checkbox on a compliance schema. It's nothing. So more. I really think I, I, one thing that I want to gloss over was the underqualification that Brian mentioned a moment ago. You know, these owners, I think, are asking questions to some degree. Some of them are complete ostriches, right? Where they're just going to stick their hand in the sand. But when you're asking an unqualified or underqualified individual about X, Y, or Z, and they're giving you an answer as the business owner or executive person in the company, you think you're making an informed decision. Hey, my IT guy, my MSP said this more likely it's wrong, but they're coming from a place. Okay. I have been educated by a person that I could trust and this is what they said. So we, when you get somebody like me that comes along or Shiva or Brian or anybody else that we kind of have on these podcasts a lot and they start educating them. No, that's not really the right way. It fucking destroys them. You know, it's when you come in and say, no, you've been doing this wrong for X number of years. This is not the way to do it. They are instantly personally felt like they are being personally attacked because they had an inform, they thought an informed decision. And you just rocked their world that they were doing it incorrectly and put things at jeopardy. Now, again, it is a maturity thing, but it, the, these people do feel like they're being attacked. I want to go one step further into that decision chain. How many of these IT providers were chosen because they were the cheapest version? Yeah. And that's what qualified them to be the trusted advisor or whatever bullshit IT guys want to call themselves these days or whatever the fuck that is. It's always a race to the bottom price-wise, especially when you get to the enterprise where you've got hundreds or thousands of people and each person is a cost center. It is. But that's when people just need to get to the point where these things are a cost of business, right? So when you bring on a new employee, you need to factor these things into your overhead or your total label, a total burden of labor. I mean, that you're, would make sense in a perfect world. It would, you know, and you know, you're going to buy potentially a cell phone for the user, depending on the industry you're in, you're going to buy a computer or a laptop. You're going to buy maybe a printer or a scanner, you know, 
depending on, again, what your environment is, what they may need. These things need to be factored in. It's like, okay, this new employee team member is going to cost me X amount of dollars per year with some of it being a yearly cost and some of it being a monthly cost. And I know going into it, anybody I'm going to hire is going to do this to my company. You know, until companies are looking at it from that aspect, I don't think anybody's going to really change. I, I find part of the maturity issues are tend to be with older management that are stuck into this idea that things are capex expenses so mm-hmm. they they run away from any operating expense and try to avoid it at all costs and they just try to stick to this idea of capex expense and and that's where you run into issues where they're not doing the exercise they should be doing like you just mentioned where they're saying hey i need to stop looking at things as capex costs and start looking at as operating costs or both right or, or yeah, both. I mean, you could always spread out a CapEx cost and, and consider it operating at that point, right? I mean, the, how you whether you pay for it up front or you pay for it, you know, monthly or, or in the rear, <laughs> if you're not paying for it at all, you'll this eventually pay for it. <laughs> Yet. You know, um, there is, there may be amplified and intensified underwear on the way, but <laughs> Dude, I didn't, uh, I didn't know we was actually going to talk about that today, but okay. It, it, well, and, the, and there's one other I- issue you brought up that's a good point out. Our, one of our largest co-managed clients that is going through acquisition mode, you know, they, we did some calculations and they were spending like 1% of their gross on, on IT. And, and we were looking at other companies, their similar size that were spending an average of 3%. So they were underspending just by comparison to companies, their size. I think that's we, bullshit fucking. Okay, well that's fine, but I'll it, tell you why after. I'll tell you. It was a it was a metric we were we were presenting to to provide s- additional evidence they need to spend more, right? It, it didn't have to be the one metric that decides how how much they spend, but but here's their argument, and maybe something you're going to bring up is they f- they they think, oh well, we're a unicorn, we can do things more efficiently. We don't have to spend as much money. Ah, fuck that. We've been doing it this way for the past 10 years. Why can't we continue doing it that way? There's and a that, problem right there. That, and, that, is, that is a thought process problem, which you mentioned earlier. Yeah. But the reason why I think that's a bullshit metric in general is I have clients, you know, if I think of one, two clients I have, one that has maybe 70 employees, the other one that has 10, they both have those two clients probably do the same amount of gross business a year. Are you telling me that, you know, 10 person company should spend 3% of let's call it a $10 million gross. And that larger company should spend the same percentage. Well, no. So when we did the comparison, it was more than just gross revenue, right? Same amount of employees, similar amount of maybe even physical locations. Right. Okay. So, so you want to dig into, Right. No, I, I thought you were going terrible. for the gross by itself, which is no. why I call that a complete bullshit metric because you have, I mean, margin isn't equal across multiple industries. So you can have smaller guys yeah. pulling in the same kind of numbers, but okay. But, but to Eric's point earlier, you know, he, he brought up the fact that, you know, now I just lost my train of thought. What was the fact you brought I'm up? I'm not editing that out. You don't have to edit it yes. out. Um, I was going down, I was on this train and then I got off on the other train. Not um, points, but I'm not sure. So, well, let me just get back to my story with this client. So, so that was their argument, right? And, oh, now I remember. So Eric brought up the issue of people feeling attacked when mm-hmm. you go in and tell them you've been doing it wrong this whole time. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's definitely a dance that you, that you have to, that I had to do with this client. Like I had to like show him, them numbers to get them to want to change their behavior without telling them they've been doing it wrong the whole time. Right. And, and what's worked well, it, and it's really the truth, right. Is that the landscape has changed. It, it, the landscape today, isn't what it was 10 years ago. There's things we have to worry about today that Dude, we I didn't have. Sam, it was a year ago. Well, yeah, that's fair, right? But I'm I'm just saying like that's 
how I've gotten the discussion, like, Hey, what you're doing now may have worked, you know, back in the day, but it's not going to work today. So we have to, we have to change with the times essentially. Right. Yeah. And this may be a little bit off topic and I know we, we kind of really dived away from, you know, asset management, but you mentioned a moment ago, Brian, about mergers and acquisitions. And it got me thinking, I forget who or where I saw this from not so long. It was within the last week or so, but somebody was mentioning that acquisition companies are now putting into their contracts. So their M and a, uh, M and a purchasing yeah. someone that mentioned that John from black point. Oh, was it him yeah. where they are actually saying, okay, if you have some sort of vulnerability or you have some sort of compromisation that it's built into the contracts. Now, if this could be proven that this is stuff that's happened before your m a went through then you are essentially on liable for it the new company who through their acquisition is not liable for that and i think that's a massive massive change where you're not assuming any and all risks of the company that you come into and you think it's because of asset management you know they're not disclosing in an m and uh mergers acquisition all the assets that they have so you've got things that are out there that may be susceptible. Well, I think asset management is not just the IT infrastructure, right? It's the reports on that IT infrastructure. It's any post-incident work product. Those all fall into asset management. And that's why I think it's so important, even though nine, not on. A lot of, a lot of practitioners don't practice asset management, in my opinion, and in my experience, the, well, the big circle jerk I've seen we have compliance or asset management is the goddamn Kaseya network detective. 300 or 600 pages of absolute bullshit. Oh, uh, yeah, the Rapid 7, yeah. Dude, uh, not Rapid 7. The no, no, no. Rapid Fire Tools. Yeah, that's it. Rapid 7 actually knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah. That Rapid Fire Tool product is an exercise in clearing the Amazon rainforest. <laughs> that's all it's worth. Well, the. So asset management, it actually aligns well with what you're talking about in acquisitions. Cause we just had this discussion last week with, with our co-managed client. Once you identify all your assets, the next step is, okay, what are our vulnerabilities, right? It kind of leads into vulnerability management and well, it depends. And, are they using Kaseya? Yeah, exactly. And, and so I'm having a discussion. I'm like, Hey, on this next acquisition. How can we get more info? Like IT is always the last to be involved in an acquisition. It's like, no one cares about IT. Oh yeah. We're getting computers with this. No big how deal. Old you, Brian? Right. Brian, uh, I'm how old 40, you? 42. So you're, you're old enough to remember a young man by the name of Rodney Dangerfield, right? Yeah. When he said he got no respect, he was talking about IT guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, you know, th they use a, they use a ticketing system called fresh service and it's got its own little light kind of audit agent that pulls information. Hmm. And, and I was like, Hey, can we, like, it's not a command, it's not a C2, you know, command and control product. It literally just pulls info. Yeah. And it hasn't been exploited to that yet, I guess. No, that's, I think that's a natural evolution for it. There's a lot of Silicon Valley money behind it. They're based out of India, but it's a fantastic product. The fresh, fresh service. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I liked it they, they were, they, uh, came with one of their acquisitions and they're like, Hey, should we use this? I checked it out and I was like, Hey, this looks kind of better than, than my ticketing system in certain ways, but, um, not hard, but the, the discussion we, we, we had was full disclaimer. Get... Sorry. Sorry to cut you off. I use the same ticketing system that Brian does. So when I make fun of him for that, I am yeah. also making fun of myself. Yeah. I currently use the same one and currently looking at a different one. So, so we're all fucked. <laughs> yeah, it, it's got some limitations, but, um, I'm back to what I was trying to say. I, I, I told him, can we get th this light agent installed ahead of time? Because they, these acquisition companies never provide an asset report. That's even ha you can tell just by looking at it, it's missing things like what's their licensing look like, what licensing comes with the deal, what equipment are they running that, that, that Every, might have I've never. I, I, I've seen people be mislicensed, yeah. I've seen, oh, but I've yeah. never seen someone be under licensed. Yep. So it, it, it's just something uh, by the end of the conversation, just to wrap it up, it was like, we're not allowed to know anything or touch their devices. Like 
I should say, we're not allowed to confirm anything ourselves until the acquisition's gone through, right? Well, that's a whole self attestation bullshit that everyone's yeah. hoping to abuse. But you know what you should do? Do what I do. Work with municipalities and just walking off the street, say, hey, can I put one of my command and control agents on your network? And I'm like, sure, no problem. Easy peasy. Yeah. I'm being sarcastic here. That's not But not thing. really. <laughs> I, I've done it multiple times with multiple municipalities, mm -hmm. but access control should go hand in hand with everything. So, so are you saying that you shouldn't be able to do that because the current IT should have locked down the ability to install an app like that? Pretty much. Well, let me ask you a question, Brian, and I'm pretty sure I already know the answer to this one, but in your current RMM, do you have detection set up for other RMM agents being installed on your networks? Yes. Well, not everyone that's out there. Well, originally. We, oh, Atera and Kaseya. But yeah, the, the ones they support. And then we, we use a, we don't give local admin. So we've got kind of an extra layer there where we can catch something. Um, to help mitigate that, are you doing event logs of new services being installed? We're, uh, like event log monitoring or logging. Cause I know the logs are happening. I can tell you, we're probably not monitoring them, right. To, yeah. to be alerted for that type of thing. That would be something for you to have a conversation with John. Yeah. They have the insight on the endpoint say, Hey, can you look for these processes, which are, you know, competing RMM products. And after this call, I'm going to tell you the event IDs to start looking for and plugging into your RMM. So. It is going to get noisy. So like when, uh, anyway, here we go. <laughs> but anytime, you know, a service gets updated, a program gets updated, you know, a lot of times the service gets uninstalled and reinstalled, but you know, it's, it's going to create an administrative overhead for you, but you're going to be able to see what is being done, what's being installed. So if anything looks suspicious, you'll know about it. Yeah. And that's the other side you need to know. And if anybody's interested in that, hit up Eric. You know what? Follow me on Twitter. I'll put it out there in a minute. God damn you people getting some free shit. <laughs> so what else we got on the docket for today? That's it for me, man. Just watching the news. Mr. Brian. I don't know, man. I'm just, uh, I'm on this mission to, to minimize my vendors, figure out how can I get rid of one extra vendor? Like don't I want think about minimizing your vendors. Think about minimizing your risk. Well, that's all. However, many vendors it, it, you end up yeah. with is going to be, and it is what it is. I would say, look at minimizing your risk. Yeah. And if you really want to minimize your risk, use zero MSP products. Yeah. As much I, as possible. Well, and, and it's interesting because Eric shared a post the other day on Slack with the guy that talked about his secure, how secure his clients are. <laughs> and, and, and his definition for, or his way of defining that was literally listing out like 15 to 20 different vendors or in security, which some of them even like overlapped that in my was opinion. That the security onion that I saw. And, and the first thing I thought was, do you even have all those products configured properly to do their job completely? Cause that's one issue that happens, right? I'm going to say, no. And, and, and you know, and then, and then I'm thinking, wow, look at all those different threat vectors of supply chain, you know, potential issues. So, you know, it's not about feeling like you got the big tool stack that makes you feel and your clients feel secure. It's really, are you covering the gaps in some security framework, right? What, what's your framework of choice? I've, I've bounced all over. I'm back to the, no, new, you, yeah. The new version of CIS is the one that I like. I've embraced that one as well. How about you, Eric? What's your uh, Kool-Aid of choice for compliancy? Yeah, I'm still going under the legacy, the quote, legacy CMMC. Okay. Yeah, um, I think the good one, not the hot steaming pile of shit that now has three levels. Yeah. Okay. I've already, I was already knee deep into that. You know, I will, once I get through it, I'll pivot to whatever the current comparables are, but I do think the original CMMC was a good thing to do. So I'm going through self acetation of level four, just to trigger Shiva. Um, well, you know yeah. what? At least I know when you're doing it, you're actually going to say yes when you should and know when you shouldn't and work on it. 
Whereas, yep. um, I'll leave that one right there. Well, and, and, and the reason you're doing the legacy or the reason we're not using the legacy is why, because no one could meet up to its standards. Yep. The <laughs> DOD contractors couldn't meet up to it. So they down or they chopped it off at its knees and said, okay, NIST 800-171 is now going to be the new CMMC moving forward. It, which makes perfect sense because we're no longer fighting people in caves. We're fighting people who have a technical capability. So just lower your standards. You'll be fine. No problem. Hmm. Lower the bar. When people can't hit the bar, you just lower it, right? So they say. I, I mean, I, I don't agree with that. I think you should surpass the bar. But hey, what do I know? I'm just an MSPP. So. It burns with an MSSP. <laughs> All right, this time I, I'm, I'm done. Just I got a VAM. I'm just oh, a VAM. Know this, and we will never let you live that down. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's wrap it up. Everybody, good? I'm good. All right, guys, ladies and gentlemen, and ghouls that are out there on the internet, if you have made it this far, thank you so much for tuning in for yet another episode of Amplified and Intensified.com. You know what? A recent change to the platform. Shiva has put together a new website, Amplified and Intensified.com. If you have heard anything that you have liked about this podcast and you want to engage Shiva or myself or be able to help sponsor by donating us with some coffee, all the links of our calendars, buying us coffee, past episodes of both the podcast and the YouTube version are all now on Amplified and Intensified.com. Go there for all of your needs. Thank you so much. And until next time. Take care.